Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Harvard Climate Action Week and the Division of Continuing Education. We are live from the One Brattle Studio, where our team has created a virtual park that we're inviting you here for this discussion on urban green space as both a climate and equity solution. We're so grateful that you're all here, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, the Dean of the Division of Continuing Education to welcome us to this event. Hi, everyone. My name is Nancy Coleman, and we are so thrilled to have you with us today. Uh, DCE is excited to participate in Harvard's inaugural Climate Action Week, and especially with such a talented group of guests that we've assembled for you today. Harvard Climate Action Week is a celebration and acceleration of climate research, education, and engagement across the whole university. Climate change touches every discipline we teach, research, and learn. Every school at Harvard is home to students and scholars working to meet the climate challenge, including DCE. I'm so excited that we can be part of this week-long convening of thousands of experts, decision makers, students, alumni, and scholars. Blending research and practice is what DCE's Sustainability ALM Master's Program does best. We offer the largest range of courses taught on climate change at Harvard. And our unique approach is to bring current research and solutions to real world practitioners and adult learners who can immediately integrate what they learn in our classrooms into their daily work. From learning about digital carbon emissions to understanding how communities recover equitably and sustainably from natural disasters to field work in Tuscany, exploring regenerative agriculture and more. Our courses each focus on teaching a critical climate change solution within a systems approach. This year, in fact, just over 2,700 adult learners took these courses. That number astounds me every time I think about it. Every day, we advance DCE's mission of extending Harvard to global part-time learners with the academic ability, curiosity, and drive to solve the big problems of climate change. But that's nothing new for us. In 1835, American philanthropist and businessman John Lowell Jr. founded our precursor, the Lowell Institute. Following that in 1910, Harvard President Lawrence Lowell, also a trustee of the Institute, founded the Commission on Extension Courses as an experiment in popular education. The goal was to serve those in the community who had the ability and desire to attend college, but had other obligations that kept them from traditional schools. So since 1910, DCE has held steadfast to Lowell's vision. And I'm proud to say that today, over 14,000 students join us in our classrooms and more than 800 degrees and 1,000 certificates are awarded each year. So our students, they come from diverse professional backgrounds and from all over the world. Just in the audience today for this event, we have urban planners, at least two vice presidents of sustainability of Fortune 100 companies, marketing and communication experts, engineers, economists, and Harvard staff. You're here and you choose DCE's courses because you wanna hear about solutions and become part of the solution and become a change agent. You wanna learn from a blend of research faculty and practitioners. You recognize the urgency of the climate crisis and the impact that will have on our companies, communities, and our individual lives. I'm so grateful for your energy and commitment to accelerate solutions to this, this problem. And thank you for being here today, especially during finals week. I've talked to so many of you uh, over the past year and your commitment for this work is just, just shines through in your passion. So just as our curriculum recognizes that we can't isolate people or solutions and that the climate crisis demands a holistic approach, our panelists today bring a blend of research and practice to their holistic view on mitigating climate change. In just a few minutes, we'll hear from seven experts who see the urban green space as a key climate solution and have examined the benefits to human health and biodiversity, and how these spaces undo systems of historic inequity. We'll also hear from them about how to ensure that the green space doesn't exacerbate inequality through displacement and gentrification. I hope that you'll feel after our panel today as inspired to advance this key climate change mitigation strategy in your community. 
So I grew up just south of Boston, and one of my favorite open green spaces is World's End, World, World's End in Hingham. It's about uh, 15 or 20 minutes south of Boston, and it's 250 acres of rolling green hills and Olmsted designed pathways. Walking around uh, World's End, for those of you who have been there, you get an amazing view, Boston Harbor and the picturesque Hingham, Hingham Harbor as well. It's really lovely. And I invite those of you who are in the Boston area to make sure you visit it. So I'm excited that we're gonna learn more about the Emerald Necklace Conserv Conservancy's work today as Harvard's own Arnold Arboretum and the chain of parks that make up the Emerald Necklace are key to Boston's climate resilience. They're also really enjoyable places to visit, especially at the time of year where the trees are in bloom and feel the benefits of nature that Dr. Linda Tommaso will share with us. So without further ado, let's get started. I'd like to pass the mic to my colleague, Lindy Von Mutis, our Director of Sustainability and Global Development Practice Graduate Programs. Lindy, please introduce our speakers. Thanks, Dean Coleman. <clears throat> I'm also very excited by the talent on this panel, both in the studio uh, and joining us actually from around the world. Uh, first, I do want to take a moment to thank the team behind the scenes. You don't see them, but they are the ones that make all of this possible. And, uh, and they've made it possible for all of us to be in this great conversation kicking off Harvard Climate Action Week. So I want to just thank them, give them a little round of applause. I also want to thank our colleagues at the Salata Institute for hosting Harvard's first Climate Action Week. This is a significant event, and I encourage those of you who are watching um, this session to also check out the Harvard Climate Action Week website and some of the other sessions happening throughout the rest of this week. Most are being streamed online, and, uh, and so you can participate from anywhere in the world. The, the topics range from carbon capture technology to sustainable finance to how we drive US federal policy on climate further. So, um, so check those out and, uh, and support those events from other schools as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our terrific speakers, and I'm going to start with the two that are seated here in this virtual park with me. First, Diane Regis, who is the president and CEO of the Trust for Public Land. Over the last 50 years, TPL has created over 5,000 urban parks, over 300 green schoolyards, and protected a little over 4 million acres of public land. It's incredible. Centering community in all that they do, TPL's work has been bridging the American park equity divide, and I'm excited to hear Diane share more about this today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, next, Dr. Linda Tommaso, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health here at Harvard, and also an instructor at the Extension School teaching quantitative methods in the sustainability program. Her work focuses on the positive associations between exposure to nature and health, and her studies in environmental exposure assessment seek to define metrics for capturing nature affinity that underlies the association of time spent in nature um, and its related health outcomes. So thanks for being with us, Linda. So pleased to be here, Lindy. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I'll go to the furthest uh, person uh, away from Cambridge. Dr. Isabel Angelovsky is joining us from Barcelona. She's an internationally recognized researcher on urban green space, equity, and environmental justice. Her work has been cited just over 10,000 times. <laughs> so she's a prolific expert in this field on a range of issues around green space, community engagement, equity, and displacement. She serves as the director of the Barcelona Laboratory for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability, and I'm also delighted to note that she is one of those 10,000 people that has earned a graduate certificate at the Harvard Extension School while working on her PhD in urban studies and planning at MIT. Joining us from Salt Lake City is Olivia Juarez, who works with uh, Latino Outdoors, the Utah Coalition, Coalition of La Raza, and the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance as part of the Green Latinos. Olivia has nurtured Latinx joy and leadership in conserving Nuestra Tierra Pública, and Olivia's passion for this work is clear. She was recognized as one of 10 under 40 in 2021 by the National Parks Conservation Association for their commitment to creating safe, equitable access to public lands for Latino community health. From St. Louis, Missouri, we have Katherine Werner, former director of sustainability for the city of St. Louis, 
who also understands the importance of ensuring that historically marginalized communities have access to high quality green space. Her work has been recognized internationally and won awards from the C40 initiative. She's passionate about those green spaces also protecting biodiversity, and I'm excited that she'll share a little bit about those projects with you later. A little bit closer to home is Car Karen Monty Brodick, the president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, um, and her work restores and improves the Emerald Necklace's 1,100 acres of green space here in the Boston area for all. Karen has had an impressive career spanning the spectrum of this work. Prior to joining the Conservancy, uh, Karen served as the deputy director for park planning in the San Francisco Parks Department, where she led outreach, communications, planning, and design on numerous projects and initiatives in addition to um, developing two bond measures that secured $400 million for parks um, in the Bay Area. So Karen, I'm so glad that you're joining us um, just from across town. <laughs> and then finally, from Virginia, uh, Dr. Tim Beatley joins us. He's also a prolific scholar. I think, Tim, you've been cited around 14,000 times um, on issues related to biophilia and green space. And he's the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning at the University of Virginia. Tim believes that sustainable and resilient cities represent our best hope for addressing today's environmental challenges. And he founded Biophilic Cities to ensure that that work continues in the practitioner space. As a central element of its work, Biophilic Cities facilitates a global network of partner cities working collectively to pursue the vision of a natureful city. So let's get started with this magnificent conversation we're gonna have. Um, we're convening today around the idea that nature-based solutions like protecting urban forests and creating parks are a fundamental pillar fighting the climate crisis, just like reducing greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. Nature-based solutions are known to be highly effective, create multiple community benefits, including uh, improving human, economic, and ecosystem health, yet they are not adopted at the scale and pace that are both possible and urgently needed. On Earth Day last year, the Biden administration signed an executive order strengthening the nation's forests, communities, and local economies, and directing the federal government to explore how these solutions could be widely implemented. Despite notable progress on this front and a surge in federal funding to accelerate their adoption, significant challenges remain. Today, we will explore the promises and the challenges. The climate crisis demands that we leave no stone unturned when thinking about and finding solutions. So Isabel, I'd like to turn to you first to lay out this big picture and highlight your research on the benefits of nature-based solutions and the challenge of inclusivity in climate adaptation planning. Thank you so much. Lindy, I so wish I was on Brattle Street right now, <laughs> rather than in Barcelona, even though it seems that Barcelona is currently more American than it is Spanish <laughs> and Catalan, knowing everyone who is coming to the city. But anyway, uh, thank you for having me. I have very fond memories of my time um, in Cambridge and come back very often. But um, today I'm very pleased and honored to be uh, remote. So I'll keep it quite short. And um, what I would like to highlight today is the fact that green space can serve as a tool to address historic inequities, a legacy of segregation and unequal access to green space by race and class, yet at the same time can reproduce inequities or exacerbate existing ones. Hence what I call green space inequities as a tool to respond to intersecting and compounding green space uh, inequities in the city. So this work is not just mine, it's the one of uh, BC and UEJ where I am based and where a lot of my colleagues have also contributed to the research that I will uh, present. And so the main question put a little bit differently is, does Cities Green Mission respond to equity and justice emergencies or does it actually contribute or even accelerate climate inequities? And so what is the legacy that I'm talking about? It's a worldwide uh, state of affairs that shows that by race, class, ethnicity, there is an unequal access to green space uh, where 
not only in the US, but also in cities like Barcelona, where I live, you see that the quality of green space, the quantity, the maintenance, the biodiversity of that green space is not equal depending on where you live. Par del Turo on the right versus Par de la Trinidad, one of the newest parts of the city, yet still surrounded by um, highway contamination. If we move one step further towards the um, climate emergency, what do we also see in terms of historic inequities? Is that working class neighborhoods like La Prosperitat, here on the white in Barcelona, are urban heat islands. They have very little green space, while upper income neighborhoods like the one here on the right, where Passage San Joan is located, have received a much greater tree planting um, program, as well as other street level infrastructure that have already created greater permeable pavement and cooler air during our intense heat waves. And so in the end, what we see as a challenge that cities are facing is a quadruple form of urban climate injustice with green space in the middle of it. The fact that socially vulnerable groups have least contributed to climate change that's very known, are most exposed to impact, and have fewer means to adapt, as the previous slide was just showing, and yet are also most likely displaced by future or most recent climate resilient infrastructure, which is the second part of this equity challenge that I want to delve more into. Why do we see this challenge? And why have we put so much emphasis on understanding these new types of inequities? It's because of the widespread deployment that we are seeing in cities of green infrastructure because of their multifunctionality, their low cost approach, and their health and socioeconomic benefit. And we let others go more into those. The problem is that oftentimes this agenda is articulated as part of a global green mission, like for example here, the 2018 Boston Harbor Plan that laid out the greening of 70 square kilometers of waterfront to support the city in its fight against sea level rise and flooding. And so this green mission is meant to designate cities as the most climate resilient, as the greenest, as the most livable cities. And in the end, it's a form of competitive urbanism where not only urban planners and the residents of those cities are working together to make cities greener for all, but actually there is a competition where also private investment and the financialization of greening come into play to actually create a competitive urbanism that can privatize greening or make it exclusionary, which is in the end, the broader question that those greening interventions are raising for us. For whom are those greening interventions in the mid and long term? And to what extent are intersectional social climate vulnerabilities accounted for? So in the end, this is what we end up seeing and calling green gentrification. This paradox that global cities are facing, which is that rather than being a universal benefit for all, greening can become a source of division. And here in particular, it's the di dividing access to nature through displacement and segregation of working class and racialized residents. This is a complex figure to just try to summarize briefly what we are talking about. So we have a bit this greening 2.0 that I'm calling, which is this new generation of greening for its multifunctionality, which is in globalizing cities, creating three dynamics on the right. It's creating greater building and marketing of new higher end green homes and others, increasing land and property values and costs, and producing an exclusive use of green amenities, which then is creating um, or accelerating gentrification and thus pushing residents away through an indirect form of displacement into grayer and less climate secure neighborhoods. Why? Because those are the ones that residents are able to afford. Sometimes not as much in the US, but in many places in the global so south, Medellin, Jakarta, you see projects that are directly demolishing the homes of informal residents to be replaced by greening. So you have this direct displacement. And so how do we study this? In the lab, we study this in four different ways. Financial displacement, physical, 
aesthetical and social cultural. I won't go into all of those dimensions. Let me just show you the brights of cities where we are working, uh, 30 cities between uh, North America and Europe, where we do both quantitative and qualitative studies. And so one of the first studies that we conducted a few years ago was to look at the relationship between high levels of greening and green branding and an affordability. And what we found was a statistically relation, statistically significant relationship between the two. That is that cities that are greener and are um, presenting themselves are green are the most unaffordable. That's an image of Vancouver known as ranked as number one in terms of livability and greening around the world, and yet also fully and completely unaffordable. So what do you see in the end? A limited elite access to the benefits of greening. We also see it in the ways in which investors are capitalizing around greening or on greening, which is what we call green grabbing. They are able, as we have seen in interviews we've conducted in 50 cities, to extract financial and aesthetic value from either financing greening or locating uh, luxury buildings next to greening. Greening guarantees, in a way, value and credibility to investors and consumers. Those developers, for example, here on the right, um, here in East Boston have been able mm -hmm. to get better interest rates in order to finance their projects because they were they were green. So there is an appropriation, a privatized appropriation of those social, societal and health benefits that we know greening produces. That's an example very close to me, Bosco Verticale in Milan, where the most affordable, supposedly affordable apartment cost 3 million euros more or less $3.5 million. If we now look at who gets to live in, um, let's say, green neighborhoods in global cities, we see this process where greening contributes to gentrification. That is, contributes to the displacement and to the replacement of working class, browner residents, people with lower education degrees by wider, wealthier, and more educated residents. If you take, for example, the cities on the right, those are the ones where greening is the most important factor in explaining why cities gentrified. Atlanta, Austin, Montreal, Vancouver, the example I just gave, and in Europe, places like Copenhagen also very regularly rated like the most uh, livable city in Europe or, or not in France. And so at the end of the day, you see this physical displacement and you also see through some of those residential uh, residents, let's say quotes, the feeling of exclusion that green gentrification can produce. For example, in Montreal, a resident sharing with us, we have a lot more police in the neighborhood that we used to have and kind of do patrols of the port. So it's harder to have a healthy mix of people in places. In Dublin, we feel so excluded from it that it's a deep anger. It's a big anxiety and a deep feeling of isolation. That's a working class resident in the Liberties. And then in Washington, D.C., when they are done with the park, most of us probably won't be able to, won't be here to enjoy it. We will be good enough to serve you Slurpees and hot dogs at the River Festival, but not to live there. And so at the end of the day, what is the risk? To see an exclusive climate protection, maladaptation, and unequal climate security, and the risk that under green gentrification dynamics, disruptive green landscapes risk replacing therapeutic spaces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I think that really frames nicely the challenge of doing um, urban green space work well. Um, I want to ask Olivia, um, if I may, to share a little bit about um, another aspect of this challenge uh, from, her, from her own work. Sure, thank you all so much. So the work of Green Latinos um, and the Green Latinos community is to achieve environmental liberation. And that is a state, uh, a state of being personally in this country, in the world, um, in our neighborhoods even, where nobody and no place is ever used as a sacrifice zone. And part of what it means to be sacrificed uh, means being neglected. And so as an organization and as a community, the national Green Latinos Familia is opposing sacrifice and being neglected by working together to protect public lands and improve access to nature. 
I am the Public Land Program Director at Green Latinos, uh, where I lead our um, many year long campaign to make sure that our community members have equitable access to nature, to make sure that we are well represented uh, throughout the stories that are told on public lands, as well as uh, in jobs and leadership for the administration of our public lands. Um, and uh, when I say having access to nature, I mean it in a really wide sense. Uh, conservation has long time had a, an over encumbrance of being resourced and focused on at a federal uh, national scale uh, to the exclusion and even neglect of city lands, county lands, state lands. Um, and we work on all of the above, recognizing that uh, some of our most vulnerable communities um, people on the front lines of uh, nature deprivation, of urban heat island and heat exhaustion, um, and a plethora of other effects coming from the diminishment of nature and the climate crisis live in our cities and aren't necessarily um, on what we might typically call the backyards of our um, large landscapes and uh, huge opportunities for conservation lands otherwise. Um, so one of those campaigns that Green Latinos has taken on um, in uh, recent years was the campaign to get Castner Range National Monument designated, uh, which just was a huge success um, in the Biden administration uh, this past March. Um, the people of El Paso, Texas, of Las Cruces, New Mexico, of um, many communities and neighborhoods surrounding the Franklin Mountains um, down uh, in El Paso, uh, Texas, have campaigned more, for more than 50 years uh, to see the cleanup of unexploded ordnance um, in the Franklin Mountains um, on Fort Bliss. Uh, for, 50, for more than 50 years, uh, people have not been able to enjoy what otherwise would be a really beautiful, natural open space to be able to uh, take respite in, to be able to get away from day-to-day uh, -day stressors and uh, take in the uh, physical, um, psychological, even social benefits that open spaces provide. Um, and that has been an essential sort of uh, medicine that has been missing in the community of El Paso for a long, long time. Nine in 10 Latinos and almost 95% of low-income communities in the area surrounding Castner Range National Monument are nature deprived. Um, a nature deprived community is one that is experiencing higher than average nature loss. So whether that's uh, parks diminishing, um, being taken out of commission um, and other aspects of green space or tree canopy being lost, um, these are ways that, uh, especially in Texas and in El Paso, uh, some of our most vulnerable communities have been impacted. Uh, but over 50 years um, and then some of uh, co the community speaking out to anybody who would listen, members of Congress, um, who ultimately became uh, Representative Veronica Escobar, um, and then the Biden administration um, we're asked to give support for the designation of this sacred mountain range um, as a national monument, um, and we now have it. Um, it was designated in March. It is now managed by the U.S. Army, uh, who is going to oversee the cleanup of unexploded ordnance in the mountains, um, as well as develop a monument management plan. Um, and what I wanna iterate with everybody listening today is that the designation of the National Monument doesn't necessarily mean that the problem of nature deprivation in El Paso and surrounding communities um, is solved because there's a huge moment right now for monument management. Um, there still has to be this entire process where community members locally and nationally get involved with uh, the US Army and um, call for uh, not only um, access to nature um, at the monument uh, via how the monument is managed, but also physically getting there and then being able to get there and feel welcome and knowing what you're doing um, and how to be a good steward of the place. Uh, so for example, buses, Latino Americans are twice as likely to rely on buses um, and uh, have uh, twice as likely to not have access to their own personal car. Um, 
than compared to white Americans. And so uh, public transit is essential for um, eradicating nature deprivation. Of course, culturally competent um, interpretation and other services provided in our natural spaces are essential for people uh, feeling welcome, uh, feeling like they know uh, code of conduct, how to behave, how to be uh, stewards of our natural spaces. Um, and then even going further is what we're seeking is for our public land administration, uh, whether it's the Army, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, working in close partnership with local educational and workforce institutions to ensure that local community members are brought into the plethora of jobs and careers that are generating the around uh, the management and stewardship of these national monuments. Um, and so uh, we're really excited and proud to see that uh, the Kastner Range National Monument has been designated. Uh, the, the movement will go on to make sure that people continually have access to public land uh, through our campaigning. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I really appreciate that. And thanks for taking the time um, to step away from, from the work you're doing in Texas to be here with us and share a little bit about that. Um, I really want to pick up on a key thing that you said about sacrifice zones and the sort of um, theory of environmental justice that uh, that certain human beings, certain communities are able to be sacrificed and their health is able to be sacrificed and they are able to be deprived of nature in order for others to thrive. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's so interesting uh, that you're working on that in sort of an advocacy practical perspective. And I want to turn to Linda Tommaso who is working on research around that nature deprivation and some of the qualitative aspects of that. Um, maybe you can share a little more about your research, Linda. Thank you so much, Lindy, and thank you. Um, compliments to all the panelists here, and I hope to add a little bit of my own research and what we do over at the School of Public Health, because while there's really a plethora of research that has established the connections, beneficial health uh, um, advantages that being in uh, nature uh, natured environments, natured settings, but particularly we need to recognize that urban nature is becoming increasingly important as a locus for health and well-being, as a place where we can both be restored attentionally and emotionally, but also in-stored in, in the sense that we can build resilience up that will make us healthier in the long term. And nature affinity, as Lindy pointed out, is so important to this because clearly those that are exposed to nature and are really um, introduced in a healthy way to how nature can provide the sense not only of recreation, but joy and um, emotional and psychological well-being, which then can be carried into adulthood. So I'm just going to show you, as an environmental researcher, I love qualitative research because that's also, what is the story behind the numbers? The numbers mm -hmm. tell one story, but then going out and actually not just uh, accumulating data, but being where people are, doing what people do in nature is something that really interests me. So this is uh, uh, just results of a paper um, that is being um, reviewed for publication at the moment. We went into three urban parks where people are doing their routine green exercise, outdoor walks in nature, and not in as a field experiment, not something that is staged or designed for them, but catching people where they are and asking if they would like to participate in health-related research that's going to actually look, are there cognitive and emotional changes doing what you are doing in realistic contexts? And so we had people in this situation that across all races, we had five races participating, we had seven decades, we had all types of um, shapes, forms, educational levels from tech, high schools, all the way up to professional degrees. And so catching people and gave them the opportunity to participate with QR codes before and after what they were, uh, what they entered the park to do that very day. And these are three Olmsted, um, parks, including the Emerald Necklace here. And if you could see here on this uh, particular graph, what I've done is separate this. People would go and we categorize them half an hour, an hour, uh, half an hour to an hour, I should say under half an hour, 30 to 60 minutes and uh, over 60 minutes, so over an hour. Uh, people are doing what they're doing, but at the same time, this is not a dose response. Originally, we we're interested, is there a magnitude of greater effects for spending more time in nature? We found that every, every time category had statistical significance because people come with their expectations. People come with a perceived need. And this bore itself out in cognitive 
a battery of tests, both uh, Stroop response. So if you've ever seen a Stroop test, that's where you have um, different words that are printed, often in colors that are incongruent to the printed word. So you have the word green, but written in red ink. You have to pick R for red, not G for green, the ink color. And so you're looking, are people getting this right? How fast are they processing these speeds? And also, what is the uh, difference? Are they improving in sense of the incongruence? Are they uh, able to sustain the interference by the directed um, attention that is softened outdoors in nature? This shows you both on the left, the Stroop response and the addition response, every age category, and I'm behind each age category is also every time category, people are clearly improving before and after a period is as short as 20 minutes or as long as two hours in nature. And this is, you can see on the left, especially, it attenuates a little bit at older age, but look at older people are terrific at doing mental math. So it's almost as flat as a 19 year old that's taking their exams in college. I thought this was fascinating. And then here also, urban green space improves mood. And there's a lot of research also to document that. But we found in particular, if you look at the uh, graph on the left, so you have the lowest incoming mood scores. Those are under 40 on a scale of 72, that this is the multidimensional mood questionnaire. These are being introduced by people that particularly younger age categories, 18 to 24, and again, 20, 25 to 34. People are coming in. These tended to be college students. Obviously, this was the fall. They are fatigued. They are underslept. They come in with overall more negative moods. But everywhere from the lowest all the way to the yellow group, which are, are 65, we stopped at 75, but to be honest, we had up to 82. They come in with such a high level of expectations for this experience measured by that pretest mood baseline scores. And they leave with an even higher quotient of mood scores because they have found their personally defined needs satisfied by the experience they set in nature. So you come where you, you come in, where you come in, and you leave even higher. And as we look to the right, here we have the uh, mood changes um, uh, per the duration of outdoor time. And it is that group all the way to the right, that these are the younger groups, the, as you can see, the darker groups all the way to the C group. These are the people that spent at least an hour in nature and they are soaring. They come in low and negative. They come out unexpectedly refreshed. So this is the idea of what routine contact and realistic conditions of nature can do for us. I'm going to just move quickly to the idea of, or the concept we're looking at today is how can urban nature assist with equity issues and again, improving health. So uh, the School of Public Health, our environmental health researchers, were collaborating with the Harvard School of Design Landscape Architects to introduce an urban linear forest to Springfield, Massachusetts as a pilot site. Springfield, like many, um, many under-invested, under-serviced, old industrializing towns in the Northeast and probably in the Rust Belt as well, have found an underinvestment in, in very denatured legacy um, areas. So projecting what could be an urban linear forest for the next 40 years, uh, you're seeing the designs that are coming in, the computer designs, the rendering, but also we now are partnering with the visualization lab here at Harvard to say, this is simply not enough to be a prototyping exercise. We are going to replicate this through a sand table that will be brought out with the LIDAR capture of these particular neighborhoods where an urban linear forest will then be captured and digitally twinned. And we're going to bring it out to the very neighborhoods where this intervention is projected. In order to have participatory research, so this is another computer rendering, in order to get feedback from the impacted residents where an intervention is proposed. And this is something that often falls short when you have these nature-based um, solutions for health. What does environmental justice actually look like if we're excluding the people that are intended to benefit from these interventions so that the participatory research it itself becomes an intrinsic part of climate mitigation? and so that we learn from the future and that the designs could be complementary and more beneficial for a health and well-being perspective for local residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. And I think you have really brought together three things that the Trust for Public Land um, works on <laughs> in a holistic way that Isabel and Olivia have also brought uh, to the, the conversation in their comments, which is that 
These kinds of nature-based climate solutions not only address climate change, but improve human health and improve equity. And I, I often like to think of the Trust for Public Land as an environmental justice organization for that reason, Diane. I'll, I'll agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love for you to help connect some of these threads and share a little bit about how the, the idea that these three things are in, in intertwined in, a, in an inextricably intertwined kind of way um, to, to the work that you're doing and talk a little bit more about how you, how you center communities in your work. Well, Lydia, first, let me thank you for inviting me and for bringing this panel together. The work that you're doing, the leadership you're exercising at the Extension School to connect those of us in the field doing this work every day with communities, with the scholars who are helping us understand how it fits is so important. And this is a unique group that you've brought together. So thank you for that. You know, we've been hearing about how climate, health, equity, and community can all be advanced by better access to green space. I want to just highlight a couple of statistics to ask everyone to keep in mind as we think about this. The first one um, is, I, I find when I talk with audiences, they are shocked, as they should be in this country, about the magnitude of the life expectancy gap. Um, in Chicago, which has the biggest gap from one zip code to another, there's a 30-year difference in life expectancy from one part of the city to the next. Same thing is true where I live. Same thing is true probably in every city where everyone here sitting in this country um, lives. And that gap is the result of lots and lots of issues. And it is a gap that we can address. And part of addressing it is access to green space. I want to say up front, access to green space isn't going to solve the whole problem, but we can really make a big difference. So what does that gap look like when we're thinking about the impact on health, the impact on life expectancy, impact on uh, climate, heat, flooding? Let's, I want to just dig into what is the park equity gap in this country. So 100 million people, including 28 million kids, don't have access to a park or nature within a 10-minute walk of home. And we believe that should be something that is available for every single person in this country. Um, and in the 100 most populated cities, we took a look at what's the difference in how much green space folks have access to. And there's a number of other issues we need to dig into, like park quality. What we found is there's 43% less park space per person in Black, Hispanic, Asian and indigenous neighborhoods than in white neighborhoods. And if you look, as Isabel was saying, between high income and low income, you see a, a very similar difference. You also, um, I want to highlight, we've been talking about that nature is a climate superpower. And on average, the air temperature is going to be six degrees cooler. And in some places, we've seen studies that find as much as a 17 degree difference. So imagine you're living in a city and it's a 97 degree day or 100 degree day. How much difference six degrees makes? How much difference 17 degrees makes? So this matters. We all know by instinct that it matters. It's common sense. But the data and the sciences you've been hearing from the, our scholars um, uh, really bears that out. So I want to talk a little bit about some solutions that are very much in reach that um, cities across the country with TPL's help and with the help of many other partners are implementing. The first one is community schoolyards. So if you went to elementary school in this country, you were probably sent outside to play on something that looked like that parking lot on the right-hand side of your picture. You're probably sent outside to play a big asphalt area. Maybe there were some four squares marked on it, little things that were supposed to give you games to play. Sometimes you'll find that uh, teachers, the only place they have to park is out there, and so kids can't even get out there. So what does that matter? Um, if we go and measure, so I live in California, we have beautiful weather, a beautiful 70 degree day. We go out on those asphalt spaces and I'm thinking about a place, uh, Markham Elementary, which is in Oakland, very close to where I live. Um, it was 96% paved, which is what we see all over the country. And on a 70 degree, 70 degree day, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, I'd like everyone here to imagine what you think the temperature was on that big asphalt space. Just pause. Think about it. 70 degrees outside, beautiful spring day, gorgeous. What do you think the temperature is on that asphalt parking lot, so-called playground? 
we've measured 110, 120 degrees. If you're in second grade and you are sent outside in that to play in that space, you are not going to get the learning benefits. You're not going to get the mood benefits. You're not going to get the creativity benefits that, that we all hope for by getting you outside. It doesn't count to be set out onto an asphalt play yard that looks more like a prison yard. So at Markham Elementary, TPL went and worked with the Oakland School District, transformed it, planted, I think, 75 trees, created a soccer field that kids can play on. It makes all the difference. Uh, but it's not just the difference for the school and the learning and the health of the kids. It's also difference at a community, at a city level. So TPL has been transforming schoolyards in the city of New York for some years. We've done hundreds of them there. Um, school by school, working with the kids, working with the parents to engage the community on what do you want in this place? How can we design this green schoolyard so that it matters to you, your culture, your community? But underneath, we're also addressing the infrastructure issues. So um, Shuangwen uh, School in lower Manhattan, in Chinatown in Manhattan, uh, when Superstorm Sandy hit in 2012, it was flooded on that playground and they had to close the school. So kids missed out on learning um, and it was a huge problem. So we went in, we worked with the school, we worked with the kids to design a playground, implemented it also implemented the infrastructure change. And when Ida hit just a couple of years ago, not only did the school not have to close, but there was no flood. I was told there was not even a puddle. And so the infrastructure change that can happen that then has impact citywide um, makes a big difference. So these are solutions in plain sight that any city can adopt. They're a great place to start. So I want to just talk about the path forward. Um, and what we've done is ask the 100 biggest cities, what are you doing? The good news is that the majority of cities in this country are taking steps to use climate, uh, to use nature as its superpower to help address the impacts of climate change. 85% of cities say that they are, are, are using nature to help adapt to the impact of climate change already. Think about the political differences and yet when you get down to it in the cities, they are taking action. If you're interested in more of that data, we asked a whole bunch of other questions. You can check it out on tpl.org. But I wanna talk just for a moment before I turn it back to you, Lindy, about what are some of the ways that we can avoid the negative impacts? And the number one way, and I want this to be your number one takeaway if you're listening today, that is to engage the community. Communities need to be respected in their self-determination for what they want their community to look like. And in, in markets like San Francisco, in markets like New York City, markets in cities that are having these intense displacement issues, engaging the community up front, having them be the leaders for the design so that we're in service to them is, I think, the central approach to making sure that we're building healthy communities as we go forward. Um, and that we, when we build that in from the beginning, we can also build um, other equitable practices in. And I think about India Basin in San Francisco, which is uh, traditionally a place for black families to thrive in San Francisco. And of course, San Francisco is ex uh, experiencing you know, its huge growth, not enough housing, incredible pressure on these neighborhoods. We're working with the city of San Francisco, the Parks Department, to build the biggest park San Francisco has ever built. But we are working with the community to have an equitable development plan go hand in hand so that we really think about the displacement issues up front. So with that, I, I just want to reaffirm the park equity gap is real. It's something we need to close. Everyone in this country should have a park or green space within a 10 minute walk. And we begin to, can begin to chip away at these issues of equity that are built into so much of how our history has has developed, have been so intentional over the last uh, decades and decades and decades. So, Lindy, again, thank you for bringing us together, to bring the practitioners and scholars together. We can all learn from each other. Yes, thank you so much. I, I think you gave us the perfect bridge, Diane, to actually think about how centering community is the right approach 
in a variety of locations that our practitioners here in this panel can actually speak to. So I'd, I'd like to ask Karen to talk a little bit about the work of the Emerald Necklace, because um, as, a, as someone who grew up in Boston, I have always observed the Emerald Necklace and the park system actually being very thoughtful about working with community. And this city has changed a lot since I grew up here and has, um, you know, we have seen those issues of displacement and gentrification, but we also have a real climate crisis and a real mitigation opportunity on our hands. So, um, Karen, I wonder if you could give another perspective and a, maybe a, a little bit more flavor to what Diane was meant was talking about, stressing the community involvement as as part of your work. Happy to. Uh, really great to be here, um, and I love to see projects like the Indi India Basin project that um, was something I got to work on right at the beginning. Uh, you know, take uh, you know, you know, come to fruition today. Uh, there's a there's a lot of neat things happening all over, and I I'm gonna try and go quickly. I'm gonna make sure I really only speak for five minutes because I really want to get uh, make sure you have time for questions. So I apologize if a chime rings, <laughs> um, but I do I do want to briefly talk a little bit about some of the work we do. Um, but this it is it is a really tough. I mean I don't think anyone here needs to be convinced that green spaces provide these benefits we're talking about. Like, I don't think we need to see more data about that. We know it. The question is how we do this. Um, I want to start, you know, I am, I'm speaking about uh, specific land uh, at the, here in the uh, Boston area and the Emerald Necklace. And uh, it's important that we acknowledge that for millennia before and centuries since Olmsted designed this park, a lot of people think the world started with Olmsted, but it did not. <laughs> um, there was a park, uh, this park system for a rapidly industrializing and metropolitan area. These lands and waters around greater Boston have served as the traditional site of stewardship and exchange for the Massachusetts tribe and their Pawtucket, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag neighbors to the north, west, and south. And at the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, we acknowledge that uh, the greater Boston region um, as their unceded ancestral territories. Um, and we do wanna make sure we, um, we start with this and there's still lots to do. Um, the, uh, this is an outline of the Emerald Necklace. Many of you likely know, um, know that. Uh, we put our work into three general categories. Um, we, you know, a lot of times conservancies, I think, really focus on the physical and improving and supporting the physical. And obviously that's really important. But really what we're talking about today is the the impacts of, in theory, well-meaning action on people and families. And, um, you know, when I first started working in San Francisco, uh, I remember some early projects when I went out to talk to people about improving a playground and people said we'd rather you not because we're worried about losing our housing it was mm -hmm. already in people's minds they didn't need the research to show them they already knew that this was a possibility and that's a city that has rent control which is not something that the city of boston has today um because it's really a lot of this is about housing protections we're not really talking about that today but that is the that's where the buck stops. I'm glad to see Isabella's <laughs> Isabel's head nodding. Um, a lot of the work that the Emerald Necklace Conservancy does is bring together these three public partners. You know, that is that is why we are in this climate crisis is because we believe that there are architects, landscape architects, city planners, so, you know, social workers. We've divided all of these things up so we haven't bridged the divides. Um, between all the professions so we can really support uh, the planet and, a, and the people in a cohesive way. And that is a lot of what we do. Uh, the Emerald Necklace falls under three different jurisdictions. And we noticed that a lot of the real problems, the sites that need the most help and the communities that need the most help are the ones that have been um, most divided. I'm gonna highlight one project we're working on right now. And I'm gonna just state for the record, I don't think we have uh, found a solution to addressing uh, the challenges around uh, green displacement. It is uh, it is a it's a real challenge, especially in uh, working within this nation, this country's uh, current lack of federal involvement in housing protections. Um, so other other nations have different 
protections in a different system. But uh, we, the right now, federal housing policy has put almost all of those obligations, uh, if a city chooses to take it on, on a local level. And so all of the local governments and, and, and good interests are fighting amongst themselves for the crumbs of the things instead of uh, actually seeing uh, leadership. So I'm just gonna highlight um, this one site where I think one of the tools we are trying to seize on right now to make investments in climate ready spaces is to look at sites that are have been really destroyed. Uh, this is a site within the Emerald Necklace that has been destroyed by you know the advent of the car uh, and the, the proliferation of the car. I call this the mitigating mid-century mayhem project <laughs> where we are trying to improve uh, and th this this part, which is really a part of the Emerald Necklace that is covered with an overpass today. And what we are trying to do is take the big infrastructure projects, these, these overpasses that are aging out because the mid-century stuff doesn't hold up as, as well, oh, see, five minutes, uh, as well as the, the earlier stuff. And um, we're trying to, to leverage those opportunities for a major investment in roads and transportation and water infrastructure, which is the stuff that is funded at a better and more si significant le level in our country than parks are, and trying to add the green stuff to them mm -hmm. so that they hold hold the things that we need. So this is in a, a, P, a one of the aspects of that project, which includes um, some daylighting. Mm -hmm. uh, we work uh, very hard uh, to work with our public agencies to steward the emerald necklace trees. This is the first really systematic um, GIS database of you know a significant amount of, of trees in Boston and that was uh, a leadership that the Emerald Necklace Conservancy was able to bring and now this is something the city of Boston has done for its non Emerald Necklace streets so we're glad to see that. I'm not going to spend more time talking about why it's great. I know you guys all believe this. <laughs> uh, you don't need any more convincing. Um, we do think though our work is not just physical. It is really about working with community members and creating that next generation of green stewards. Um, and so we are very happy. We've had this program for a long time to work with youth. And then the last year, and I, I'm not gonna take a lot of time to go into this, but we realized that our celebration, our recognition of Olmsted's bicentennial need to, needed to not be about focusing so much on the, the specific designs, but instead, his concepts of inclusion and bringing everyone together. So this is uh, the first time that uh, there has been able to be a machine burn, which is a traditional ceremony uh, by the native peoples. That was a project that we were thrilled to support, but we frankly wouldn't have known that it needed to happen because we live in our own little bubble. And we worked with in a community engaged process where community members nominated, supported, selected projects. And this is one that was an education, certainly for me and, and for many of us. I'm gonna try and wrap up here so that um, there's time for, uh, for conversation. Here we have a situation in Franklin Park, which is the largest part, uh, part of the Emerald Necklace. And um, it's a site that used to be part of the Emerald Necklace, but um, in the 1950s, uh, in the 1960s, this happened all over the country where mayors and other leaders wanted to put in hospitals and schools and other really important things. And instead of acquiring additional land, they plunked them on the park because they were free. And so we have a situation where that infrastructure is aging out, uh, which is a hospital here. And the public has not been asked about what they would like to see that parkland become. Instead, the the city would like to make it um, housing for the formerly homeless, which is an incredibly important need, but they haven't decided to find additional land or use other property in the area. Instead, this is seen as free and available uh, versus um, other other things that require more coordination between other groups. Like uh, there's there happens to be in this case, 17 acres owned by a different state agency underdeveloped just outside the park, mm -hmm. but it would require two agencies to speak to each other. We know it doesn't happen that that I know, it's, it, is, it, is, it is difficult and this is another example of some of the advocacy work that's about supporting people and nature um, as development occurs and it needs to right we do need to find ways to uh, include growth um, 
there are some parts of the city that have protocols and protections for sunlight in their public parks, um, two parks in the downtown Boston area, but most of the of the city does not have those protections. So most of the city doesn't have uh, the ways to ensure that community members get those benefits, those, that mm-hmm. sunshine, that green space is really available to them. And, uh, you know, again, I don't think I have the solution for these things, but these are the things we are trying to to raise up and explore. Well, so I'm going to Car- stop there. Yeah, I was going to say, Karen, I mean, if I may flip it over to Catherine Werner, I think she can share some, some very similar perspectives on how um, work within the city um, also, uh, also sort of is impacted by these challenges of communication and coordination. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here, and especially these other panelists and learning about your projects and efforts. So inspirational. I am going to bring just a little bit of my own uh, practitioner's perspective here, share some of my efforts in St. Louis, um, building on what a lot of the other panelists have already brought brought up here. Um, we know that. It's not just the climate crisis, it's biodiversity loss, the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. And we know that there is an imperative. We need to do much, much, much better to center our efforts in equity. The good news is there are many more uh, people and programs and opportunities to find those synergies and, and find that it's not a choice. It is, there are opportunities to do these things together. So I'm gonna find, um, emphasize just one facet, if you will, the biodiversity, urban biodiversity piece being centered in equity. And, and just draw your attention quickly to uh, these two photos here in the, in the slide. On the left, you see actually a group of schoolgirls that are having equitable access to nature. They, at this is a city park right across the street from their school. They have access to nature, easy access to nature, equitable access to to nature. But look at that nature. (laughs) It is um, a bunch of non-native grass and maybe a few dandelions thrown in. Not terribly inspirational or awe-inspiring. But if you look at the picture in the upper right-hand corner, there you see a representative sharing of biodiverse, uh, this is actually woodland savanna, prairie savanna in St. Louis. And these species are found in actually another city park in the city of St. Louis. So what we're trying to do here is not just ensure that people have access to nature, not even just equitable access to nature, but to ensure that that access to nature is high quality, biodiverse nature. So I thought that I would tell you just a little bit about uh, one of the projects that we tried here in St. Louis with um, a, a fair amount of success. And I also wanted to provide a land acknowledgement. And uh, here in St. Louis, the land that I'll be speaking about, the project in particular, it owes its vitality to generations who have come before us. And it includes the ancestral lands of the Illini, the Osage, and the Missouri tribes that stewarded this land for centuries. I also want to uh, thank Diane for setting the perfect stage for uh, describing the excellent work that Trust for Public Land has done in establishing the park score and give you an example of how a city actually uses that information. Yes, the cities provide the, um, the responses to the Trust for Public Land and they do the calculations. And then uh, at the end of the day, we get a rating. And when uh, the 2022 rating for the city of St. Louis came out, you can see that sort of diamond shaped blob in the middle, of course, is the city of St. Louis. Um, When you're looking at access to nature, that 10 minute walk to public green space parks and trails, St. Louis ranked at 97% when the national average is only a a disappointing 55%. Uh, So that actually is pretty heartening if you look at just the access question. But that's, that's not really enough, I think, to stop there. So when we take that deeper look, and here's another tool that the Trust for Public Land Park Score offers, and that is to take a deeper dive look at race and income, uh, some equity indicators, and overlay them on those assessments. And when you do that for the city of St. Louis, we come up with 72 out of 100 points. So obviously, uh, a, a significant decrease there, and there are many more opportunities to improve. And that's the beauty of the park score, in my opinion, uh, from a practitioner standpoint. There's never enough to go around. There's never never enough time, resources, people, just never enough capacity 
So where do you start? How do you prioritize? And this is where this kind of information can be incredibly valuable because it helps answer that question. Where do you want to get the best bang for your buck? It, of course, depends on what your um, criteria and priorities are. Who do you want to most to benefit from the innovations that you're proposing? And that's where this kind of information can become just incredibly valuable. So, Diane, thank you to you and your amazing team for providing this to uh, all of these 100 biggest cities free of charge. So um, what I wanted to speak about was a particular project that we did in St. Louis. We launched back in 2014. It's called Milkweed for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project. And uh, this is actually a, a dual prong or dual objective effort. On the one hand, we wanted to help the monarch butterflies. We had read the reports, read the scientific literature, but monarch populations were plummeting, plummeting, uh, mostly because they didn't have the appropriate habitat. And there are a lot of other reasons, um, from climate change to land management practices that are impacting that habitat. But we wanted to help the monarch butterflies, because really, who... <laughs> Who doesn't, uh, who isn't familiar with the iconic monarch butterfly? And there are very few people I found who don't like butterflies. So that was one place to start. But the other important part was the people, the people benefit. How could we roll out a project that benefits people as much as it's benefiting uh, the butterflies or more? And so we took this dual pronged approach and, and we asked this question, okay, well, as, as a placeholder for urban biodiversity, let's design monarch gardens based on the historic prairie uh, species, native species, and what, is the, what are the plant species that a monarch butterfly needs to thrive? And as you might guess, as you're looking at this picture of the monarch butterfly on butterfly weed, it's a type of milkweed or asclepius, um, monarch butterflies need milkweed. In fact, the female monarch butterfly will only lay her eggs on a milkweed plant, and the larva will only eat milkweed. And so without milkweed, you're not going to have a sustained population of monarch butterflies. So milkweed was really key, and so were nectar species as well. And the integration of these, the monarch species, the native species, and the nectar species, is a tiny, tiny microcosm of, of biodiversity. And the beauty of monarch gardens, as it turns out, the experts told us, you only need really nine species and nine square meters to have a viable, successful, effective monarch garden. Nine square meters and nine plants. So that's not a heavy lift. And so uh, what we were hoping is that actually, if we're gonna put in little monarch gardens, maybe we could do it beyond our public spaces. We could go into the, the private realm, into residential zones and so forth, and try and have the same type of, uh, uh, of success and impact. We did in St. Louis was we launched uh, basically a, a challenge. The, the mayor at the time, Mayor Francis Slay, uh, issued a challenge, a, a, which started with a commitment and said, the city of St. Louis will plant the first 50 monarch gardens. And again, they can be very small. The ones that you see here are on um, one of the firehouses and at city hall, really rather small. Um, and then we encourage the people, the community members, to plant an additional 200 monarch gardens. And the point was to reach 250 because that was the uh, 250th celebration of the city's founding the year that we launched it. So that was our, our goal. Catherine, um, can I? That picture. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I want to keep us a little bit um, on time to make sure we have enough questions for Tim um, and for Tim's presentation as well. So I'm just wondering if you can share, did you reach that goal and were you able to deliver this great result for nature and people? Yes, I'm going to skip over the schools here. We put in 50 gardens at schools. We created a pollinator pathway along the Mississippi River. And um, this in particular was at the Mary Meacham Freedom Crossing, which is an Underground Railroad historic site. So there was equity in the location and the um, community participation. But the, to answer your question, we did track um, the participation of the community members. And we offered a little uh, carrot and incentive and said, uh, we would give you one of these metal garden signs that you see in the left. If you would register after you've created your monarch garden, and put in your address and what plants you planted, a little monarch icon would pop up. 
And so that was our way of tracking whether we were going to uh, approach and meet our 250 goal. It took about two years, but this is uh, a picture from just recently. We now have about 433. We took about two years to reach the 250 goal. But what this picture tells is much more than just um, that the, the monarch, guard, monarch gardens were created all over the city of St. Louis, but they were created by people. And that, that empowering, empowering opportunity is so important that people put them in their backyards, put them on their porches, at their houses of worship, at their schools, um, because it brought them hope. But more importantly, because they could be part of the solution. And I, I think um, the Dean mentioned yeah. that at the very, very beginning <laughs> how important that is. So anyway, this is, if you want to learn more about the project, there is a website there. And of course, you can always feel free to reach out to me, even though I'm not with the city anymore. I love talking about this project. <laughs> so thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Yeah, no, thank you, Catherine. I think that's a really nice way to bring together the idea that communities that self-determination aspect that Diane and, um, and others have, have touched on today. And Tim, last but not least, I wanted you to bring us <laughs> home because I think as, as somebody who's passion for community self-determination as, as a vital part of this urban green space work led to the founding of a, of a worldwide network, um, I thought perhaps you could just share a couple of highlights um, and then we can take some questions. Uh, sure. So um, thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear. It's it's maybe not so great being at the end, but on the other hand, I'm not sure there's much else I can say. Uh, so much has been said, and it's all the wonderful presentations and wonderful work going on. I thought maybe uh, given the time, I would maybe do, do two things. One, just quickly um, encourage everybody uh, to find out more about our network. I'd love for you to visit biophilicities.org. Uh, we have more than 30 cities now, uh, new cities that have just joined, Izmir, Turkey, Colombo, Sri Lanka, city of Los Angeles here in the US. It is a vision uh, for future urbanization, future uh, cities that uh, certainly includes parks, but really is meant to be holistic and sort of understanding cities as, as ecosystems. And our aspiration in this model is to see, to see ourselves living immersed in nature and not separate from it, but very much a part of it. And with wildness uh, around us to be sure, and then the second part of this for me to, is to just reiterate this, the social justice, the equity part of all, of all of what's been said before. So we believe nature is a birthright. Uh, everybody deserves uh, nature and we've got to work hard uh, in cities and, and uh, all of the, the, the commentary or the, the research that's been uh, talked about already is, is definitely true in almost every city that we, uh, we work with. Uh, is aspiring to equity goals. And, and Lindy, it's probably dangerous for me to try to show even my four <laughs> slides at this point. Why don't you show the first one that just, gives, just shows uh, okay. the scope well, gonna, of your cities? I, I think that's, right. a really, that's a really important one for us to just understand um, the breadth of your Okay, workforce. well, that's saying uh, host disabled print screen oh. sharing. But you know what? Um, we can also pull that, it up later. No that's problem. okay. We, we, <laughs> uh, but I did, I had, I think, four slides. Uh, one was just a sort of a, an overview of what cities are doing. And again, uh, every city participating in our network has their own page at biophilicities.org with lots of information about what they're doing, uh, the opportunities for nature conservation, preservation, um, connection are different from place to place, obviously from part from different parts of the world. So it's a really interesting mix and lots of ideas about what you can do. Uh, but on specifically on the equity uh, part of it, I had a couple of slides to just make the point that uh, our cities are incorporating equity uh, targets now into their plants. And so one of the slides was about Richmond, Virginia, and they have a new comprehensive plan called Richmond 300. And they have set the goal. There is a five to 10 minute goal of every person being within a five to 10 minute walk of a park. Uh, but they've also set minimum tree canopy targets uh, for every neighborhood, as well as a citywide canopy goal. And it's uh, focused on those, those largely African-American communities that have been, have had very low levels of tree canopy, uh, largely reflecting the historic redlining maps uh, in, in that city, longstanding racism and discrimination there, uh, which has led to the uh, conditions we've already talked about. 
So minimum canopy targets focusing on those those uh, those neighborhoods that are especially in need of of trees and, and canopy. Um, second and third slide had to do with Pittsburgh. Pitt Pittsburgh has a shade tree commission. They have now adopted a tree equity goal and are going to be focusing on 10 underserved neighborhoods in that city. Um, one of those slides had to do with uh, Pittsburgh's wonderful network of city steps going back to its uh, development as a steel town. And it's a way for people to get from their, um, their hilltop neighborhoods uh, to their employment. But it's this remarkable uh, remnant pedestrian network that gets you into nature. And it's a, it's a wonderful story. We have a film on our webpage about a new film that we've made. And equity is a key element in, in that framework and how they're making investments about, about that step, that the city stair, uh, stairs and city step system. The last slide was about the 11th Street Bridge Park um, in Washington, DC. Washington is a partner city. You probably know a little bit about that story. Uh, they have developed an equitable development plan um, and they have engaged uh, the surrounding communities. It's a wonderful story. Of, 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 inclu of including from the very beginning the design of this project. It hasn't been built, ha hasn't even been fully funded yet, but that plan is being put into, into practice. Uh, just wanted to mention a few of the elements. There's a, a new home buying uh, club. There's a workforce training uh, program. Um, they, they have a, they've established a new uh, community land trust, Fre Frederick Douglass Community Land Trust. Um, wonderful story of, of financial and technical support for black owned businesses in those neighborhoods, a series of, of community gardens that are addressing the uh, uh, food insecurity, but also long term employment. So the basic idea getting ahead of the potential green displacement, the green gentrification uh, impacts that we know are going to happen to some degree. And uh, so it's not a perfect story, um, but uh, it's one of the, I think, most promising models of, of how you can incorporate more nature, bring nature to neighborhoods that need it and deserve it, but also uh, work to minimize uh, those, those, those unintended consequences and to make sure that that park is, uh, that the residents around that park or that, that green infrastructure or those trees uh, fully, fully enjoy the benefits of, of, of that investment. So that's enough. I'll stop there. You have teed up perfectly a question um, in, in the chat that I will also ask um, Isabel perhaps to weigh in on here. But um, but just a real question around um, how we protect homeowners and residents from rising costs when a neighborhood gets more green space. And I think you just shared a couple of best practices. Isabel, would you like to um, add anything here from your research? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the um, aspects, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's late here, so I'm being very rude. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Thank you> for, <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you for letting me dive in a tiny bit more. Now, one thing I wanted to just highlight briefly was that we see through our research, and I think, you know, based on the experience of many here on the panels, that you need two aspects. You need anti-displacement tools and you need um, inclusive greening. And so in that sense, you know, I just wanted to direct you to a report that we published a year or so ago called Policy and Planning Tools for Urban Green Justice, where we really dissect two different types of tools. And so in the end, you know, on the left, you have all of the uh, housing protection tools that can go from different versions of uh, rent controls, rent subsidies and vouchers, for different age groups, which is what a lot of um, European cities are doing. You have really fantastic right to return policies for mm -hmm. displaced residents in places like uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, for example, you have uh, limitations of freezes to property taxes in gentrifying neighborhoods. Uh, Philadelphia has this in place. Uh, you also have transfer or development tax on luxury housing. Boston is trying to experiment with this, uh, Vancouver has this as well. So you really need tools that are for renters, for landowners, for community members like uh, the Community Land Trust, for example, that uh, Tim was, was mentioning. And then you also need this sense of deep inclusion and engagement from the very start when you transform uh, vacant land or contaminated land into green space. And I'm not even sure, yeah. and that's a little bit what we have on the right here, mm -hmm. but I'm not even sure that this is enough in some ways uh, to talk about 
engagement because communities are also rejecting this term now in some ways a concept that we are starting to work with and we see community really wanted to see is the question of ownership of change mm -hmm. ownership of knowledge over that change ownership of resources ownership of the politics of it because otherwise greening risks becoming and this green Lulu that we talk about a lot in planning, this green locally unwanted land use, because it will be seen as a tool for displacement and for land mm -hmm. speculation. And so I really like this idea that I've, I've heard a lot in uh, American communities of color, this ownership of change aspect. Mm -hmm. Not Don't engage with us, don't bring us development or even a green space, engage on what we want and what we need and how we believe that we can deal with the very complicated balance mm -hmm of housing risks and displacement from climate change and the needs for greening that also climate change requires. Then you could yeah. tap in with a couple Absolutely. of points because I think Isabel is raising a super important point. Mm -hmm. um, anytime uh, a planner or an organization, which we try not to do, go in and say, well, we're going to build this, you know, what shape would you like the windows to be? What shape would you that's not the right question. It's really what is the community dreams. And that's why it's so important in this work to have local community-based leaders and organizations. And we have the good fortune of working with hundreds of those organizations around the U.S. so we can combine that expertise like we're hearing today with that local sense of ownership. Um, I also want to just, for our listeners, flag another reason for that local uh, leadership is every city is different in where it is and what it needs. So I'm thinking about Chicago, for example. In the city of Chicago, there is vacant land um, owned by the city that is the same size as the loop. For those of you who know Chicago, that's the Chicago downtown. Mm -hmm. And so the issues in each city are a little bit different. Or in Dallas, Texas, which is a historically very divided city by race, um, reinforced not only by redlining, but by putting highways through and then differential investment. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen in South Dallas needs to be led by, and uh, there's terrific local groups, Four Oak Cliff, one of yeah. my favorites, they just do terrific work. And so that balance between um, making sure that the community leaders are out front, the community is out front with their dreams, and then the expertise to support that, not to push it, is yeah. so important. Mm -hmm. I think that really echoes some of what Olivia was also talking yeah. about in yeah. how they do their um, their community engagement work. Um, so we've got a question from Roberto Garcia. The prob public-private development corporation partnership models are susceptible to financial and real estate profit interests. Why should communities trust that these corporations will implement equitable projects and minimize green displacement and impacts on people? I'm thinking that we've got some folks like Tim and Karen <laughs> and Isabel who might be able to jump in here um, with, with a perspective, but also you, Diane, because I know that that's something that TPL struggles with in trying to create that leadership from local um, local Or support that leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is really true. And uh, the question that this person raises is a really good one. Um, and I, I, I'm on a board of a national park organization, the City Parks Alliance. And, you know, we're park people. And I wonder if we just should stop working on parks entirely and just work on housing policy. Because by doing that, we could actually help parks. The ideas of inclusive engagement and, and it are so important. But I feel like we can make the most inclusive design in the world, but if people can't live there anymore, it's, I mean, it, you know, it's, I, I think that's the hardest problem to, to tackle and it's hard from the seats that we are in right now and I don't know how to do it, um, but we, uh, you know, and we are right now, the mayor has introduced a very modest uh, rent stabilization proposal for the city of Boston and um you know it's really it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing but a lot of the city council and others are supporting that but if those th those things aren't there it it becomes it's it's very you know difficult if you're welcomed that's great but you might not be we might not be and that 
is fair. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, I mean, I think we've heard some real positives here, um, and I think it's still important for us to keep those those uh, challenges in mind on how to do this work well. So I wanna bring our session to a close um, because we are almost at time. Um, we will be sending out the recording for this with some additional information for those of you who are interested in following up and reading some of these reports that folks have mentioned um, during the session today. Uh, and I encourage you uh, again to check out some of the other activities happening for Harvard Climate Action Week all over campus. Um, and I should say not all over campus alone, but also in the virtual space uh, where you can participate and hear from um, some national and international experts, many like what we've heard from today. So I just wanna say a big thank you to our panelists today. This was really, um, really wonderful. And, uh, and I, I know that um, I learned a lot, <laughs> even as somebody who's worked in this space. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure you all did as well. Um, so thank you again for taking the time to be here from different time zones and different parts of the country and share some of these wonderful examples and your knowledge and research with us today. Well, thank you for your leadership. <laughs> thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, well, everyone, yes, have, thank a, you. <laughs> have a wonderful Climate Action Week, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> we'll follow up.